Now I know what you're thinking. Holy shit, what is this? What? 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 Don't worry, this is temporary, sort of. It's a new thing I'm trying out with reviews, so hope you guys like it, I guess. And no, this is not a ripoff of just a robot. It just happens to be coincidence. What, a guy can't be in a robot suit and just and talk about movies and stuff? I mean, it's a coincidence. Trust me, by the next review, it'll be somebody else. But until then, let's talk about the Marvel Cinematic Universe for a bit. I mean, I have a love-hate relationship with this franchise. I mean, well, look at the good movies they got. There's only seven movies I, that I like that range from okay, watchable, to, like, great. You know, the other ten that's been out so far is just not, not that good. They're either okay, I don't really want to see this again, or just merely bad. So, let's talk about the one that I actually thought is good. This is my second favorite Marvel film, Iron Man. Now, before this movie came out, I had zero hope for this film. Uh, you know, my prior knowledge of Robert Downey Jr. was just him being the punchline for every black sitcom in the in this fucking nineties. But <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I thought this movie was gonna stink on ice. And plus, the misinformation that the tin can armor was gonna be his official armor throughout the movie, I was like, oh, this is gonna suck. But it was actually really good. I came out of this, came into the movie wanting to hate it, or even thought it was gonna suck. And I came out of it going, wow, that was that was good. And it wasn't really a, my expectations were so low that it actually was better than I thought it was, because I've seen this movie dozens of times, and it was, it's just great every time I see it. First off, Robert Downey Jr. is fantastic as Tony Stark. He's not 100% comic book accurate. I mean, if you want to see a 100% accurate Tony Stark, see the Iron Man cartoon, specifically season two, because that was actually the better season. Season one felt more like G.I. Joe, but... Season 2 really was was really well done. But he's an excellent actor and a likable version of Tony Stark, so that's a plus. Unlike Doctor Strange, who was an unlikable dick for most of the movie, Tony Stark is a likable dick. Wait. What? And the opening scene is so intense. It goes from 0 to 100 in... 2 minutes. But it starts off with a nice conversation and breaks into a shootout. A shootout where not only soldiers get killed by Stark's weapons, but Stark himself gets nearly killed by his own weapons. That's a weird twist of irony, right? <laughs> Ugh. Anyway, it sets the tone for the rest of the movie. It tells you there's gonna be some humor, there's gonna be some serious shit in this thing. So, that alone just got me ready to watch the rest of this film. I'm already, I'm already in, I'm all in, I'm engaged. The award scene, I think it was great because it tells you all about Tony Stark without an awkward narration scene. You know, like in those really bad Resident Evil movies. My name is Alice, and this is Tony Stark's story. He was an MIT at the age of 12, and then he owns Tony Stark Industries. This is the end of my st- uh, fuck you. I thought Jeff Bridges was good in this movie. He's not the best MCU villain ever, but he's definitely the best Iron Man villain. He doesn't have a whole lot of development throughout the movie. But he's semi-likable until he's revealed as the villain. Plus, I sometimes forget it's Jeff Bridges. You know, Kevin Flynn. Mr. Lebowski. Well, wait, wait let, me, let me explain something to you. Um, I am not Mr. Lebowski. You're Mr. Lebowski. I'm the dude. So that's what you call me, you know? Uh, that or uh, his dudeness or uh, duder or, uh, you know, El Duderino, if you're not into the whole brevity thing. All right. Anywho, I do like the friendship between Tony and Rhodey, even though I do like Don Cheeto as War Machine better. But Terrence Howard did a good job. That's, that's good for him. Until he kind of, you know, leaves for financial shit. I was not too crazy about changing Jarvis into an AI, but it does shave off one less character from the movie. Plus, there's no need for a butler if he has Pepper doing everything for him. And the humor is pretty nice. I mean, it got crazier and stupider with each phase, but Iron Man's humor was actually funny, from stuff like this... Two... One... Two running gags like this. 
for lack of a better option, dummy is still on fire safety. If you douse me again and I'm not on fire, I'm donating you to City College. Please don't follow me around with it either, because I feel like I'm going to catch on fire spontaneously. Just stand down. If something happens, then come in. Kill power. Basically, the humor is well timed and well placed, unlike the later MCU films. And I think Pepper's a decent character in this movie. I mean, yeah, she does get annoying in the sequels, but in this movie, she tries to be the concerned voice of reason for Tony. And I do, I do love that subversion of expectations in the end. If I were Iron Man, I'd have this girlfriend who knew my true identity. She'd be a wreck. She'd always be worrying that I was going to die. It's her proud. The man I'd become, she'd be wildly conflicted, which would only make her more <clears throat> crazy about me. Tell me you never think about that night. What night? You know. Are you talking about the night that we danced and went up on the roof and and then you went downstairs to get me a drink and you left me there by myself? Is that the night you're talking about? Mm hmm Thought so. And despite the sequels, I did like seeing Tony and Pepper's relationship develop throughout the MCU. And this movie is more of a budding romance, but that becomes more by the end of Iron Man 2, so at least it pays off. At least something good came out of that mess. And the acting in dialogue is well done. They sound like human beings rather than fucking comic book characters, at least. Yeah, I know they're comic book characters, but, I mean, they don't sound like comic book characters. You, you know what I mean? And this movie has some good visual effects. I mean, Iron Man feels like a real character rather than a digital hunk of CGI looking at you, Ultron. And in my honest opinion, Iron Man has the third best CGI in the MCU. Second is Doctor Strange, and the first is Captain America the First Avenger, so... I mean, sorry, you just can't beat that Chris Evans. I mean, that's just insane. And I will say, this movie does a good job of setting up Tony Stark as a billionaire on top of the world to a man in the depths of fucking hell in the cave portion of the movie. I mean, you can see his entire fucking life come crashing down when he sees the electromagnet in his chest. That, I just felt bad for the guy. And we got Yensen, one of the best fucking characters in this movie. He's Tony's motivation to do better and be a better person, so, I mean, he he actually adds to Tony's arc in this movie. And, uh, once Yensen dies, which was, oof, it pushes Tony to not let him die in vain and actually try being a better person. And while the Ten Rings were a cliched Middle Eastern terrorist, I mean, seriously, they are super cliched, it was nice to see the writers choose a more topical terrorist for the time. You know, rather than the Chinese communists in the comic books. And I really like the music from Ramin Jawadi in this movie. His music, coupled with the building of the arc reactor montage, makes it one of my favorite scenes in the MCU. But I did find it weird that the terrorists let Stark and Yensen play backgammon while they were, you know, they were watching them, right? I mean, when they say, hey, get back to work, or were they just the terrorists napping at the time? I, I, I don't know. And the scene with the Ten Rings leader, Raza, I had to look that name up, by the way, threatens the incident was pretty nerve-wracking. Like, no matter how many times I see it, I get tense up, like, ugh, I hope he doesn't put that fucking thing in his mouth. That, that, that looks, ugh. But the editing in that scene is a bit weird, like, he's clearly at the door in this shot, I think it was belongs to this alternate scene in the movie. Big time, sorry. Yeah. عينك عليه. خلي بالك منه. ها؟ إيش تعليك يا عمي توني؟ إيش ت؟ أبو ولا ما شافوه؟ You have till tomorrow to assemble my missile. You have till tomorrow to assemble my missile. I mean, I'm glad they changed it, but it's just kind of weird editing in there. 
And I love that between him building the arc reactor and him building the Mark 1 suit, the movie doesn't just say he's smart, it shows he's a fucking genius. And, uh, the instant sacrifice, I'll admit, was expected, considering I had, you know, read the comic book before. But, it's still a sad moment. Again, part of it's part of what changed Tony Stark's life. And the escape from the cave was one of the most satisfying moments in the Iron Man trilogy, and one of the best MCU moments. Just seeing him in that armor suit just beat him around those douchebaggy fucking terrorists was just so satisfying. This is a weird appraisal, but when Tony Stark is found in the desert, it, it feels like an earned moment. I mean, after being blown up, forced to build weapons, making and losing a friend in the process, I mean, Rhodey fighting him and bringing him back to the States, it was just another satisfying moment in this beginning part of the movie. And I know Phil Coulson doesn't do much in this movie, but I do think the writers for giving us a character who will end up being a fan favorite in the MCU. Again, another odd appraisal for this movie, but bear with me for a second. But Tony Stark's decision to shut down the weapons division of Stark Industries having serious consequences actually adds tension to his return. I mean, Obadiah Stane and Rhodey are not 100% happy about it, and Pepper's just trying to be supportive as his company's about to fucking crumble and put around him. But Tony Stark building the Mark II armor and the flight stabilizers and shit, that was really interesting and enjoyable scene to me. And all that leading to, like, the, the first flight scene, that shit, that was a really well done scene, I'm not gonna lie. I was in, I remember being in the theater just like, wow, this is fucking fantastic. And Stane's betrayal was expected, again, you know, because of the comics, I have prior knowledge of the comic books, so I know he's a villain, I know he's the Ironmonger and all that. But his involvement in Tony Stark's kidnapping and his assassination attempt, I mean, I did not see that twist coming at all. So, and I, and it, but it did make sense, so I'll, I'll give him credit for that. It, it made sense, and these two villains have a common agenda, even though, you know, Stane just wants it all for himself, so he ends up killing the other guy. I think the only other time I was shocked by a twist like that was the Vulture twist in Spider-Man Homecoming. I think. I gotta look through the rest of these movies and remember that. But I think that was the only other time I was shocked by a twist like that. I mean, at least in the MCU anyway. I mean, there's other twists in movies that shocked me. But as far as the MCU go, that scene and the Vulture reveal, that was it. And the Mark III suit-up moment was fucking excellent. From the comic book style visuals to the score, I mean, it actually pumped me up for the debut of the Invincible Iron Man. And the Gull Mirror battle was fucking fantastic. From the iconic sound design of Iron Man's propulsors to the great visual effects on Iron Man. I mean, <laughs> the brief battle with the tank was badass and the dogfight was exciting as well. I mean, I, I it, this was like some of the best action in the MCU. I mean, of course, that'll be all topped by the Winter Soldier, so don't, don't get me wrong there. I mean, I still think the Winter Soldier has some of the best action, I think, in the MCU by far. But up until this point, I, it was it was really good. I mean, this, this action was fantastic in this movie. But one gripe I had, the other one with the backgammon, that was minor. But this was kind of a major one as far as story. Why would Stain have evidence of his involvement with the Ten Rings on his computer? Like, seriously. Why not delete the evidence and just be done with it? Plus, since when could a video translate someone's person, another person's voice? Like, she just types in translate, and that guy's voice is now speaking English. Like, <laughs> and since when a translate button could make a thing speak English? I've never seen that before. Have you? <laughs> I never did. But despite that, the Peppa Obadiah scene in that same in that same scene, it was it was full of fucking tension. Like, I was like, I was a little nervous when he was just like getting closer to her and. Just trying to talk her up. I'm like, I, I think he might toss her out that fucking window behind them. <laughs> like, it, it was it was really it was really tension filled with that one. And Stain taunting a paralyzed Tony Stark was just also another tension filled moment. And I think it was a well shot scene too. Like that moment where it's like tilted and it kind of follows over Daya when he sits next to Tony Stark. I mean, that was that I actually like the way they did that. And I, got, I can't lie, that War Machine tease was pretty fucking great. <laughs> I was thinking like, oh man, we gotta wait till the next movie. But and <laughs> I love the irony. Next time, baby. He's like, yeah, not for you. <laughs> We're waiting for a better War Machine. Honestly, look, I had no problem with Terrence Howard in this movie, but Don Cheetah was way better as War Machine. And the final battle between Iron Man and Iron Monger was okay, but it felt like something out of Transformers, which is not good considering that movie came out the year before this one, so. But it was nice to see Iron Man use some of his intelligence to defeat Ironmonger rather than just punch him to death and shit. 
And I could be wrong. And don't quote me on this, but I think this movie gave birth to the blue beam and the sky trope as in damn near every superhero movie these days. Oh boy. Or comic book movie, I should say. Not just superhero movies, you know. I mean I think it was in Transformers, I think it was in TMNT, Iron Man, I think it was in the Avengers. Holy shit. I think Iron Man gave birth to that one. And I think the shield reveal was a great moment for comic book fans. I mean, especially for me, like when I was in the theater, like my dad looked at me like, is it are they talking about Shield? Like Big Fury and Shield? <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was just sitting next to me, just smiling like idiots, you know. I was just like, holy shit, Shield in the movie. And then there was this moment. The truth is. I am Iron Man. Do I need to say anything else? Need I say more about that? And the Nick Fury end credit scene was pretty fucking excellent. I mean, <laughs> and it, it was a nice booking for the for already great movie and just a fucking it was just a great tease for the Avengers, man. Like I was thinking, like, wait, are we going to get the Avengers? Is is the Avengers coming? You know. <laughs> and then four years later, we got a pretty good movie, which was the Avengers. So. That was, that's a, this whole scene started everything. Overall, between Spider-Man and Batman Begins, this is actually one of my favorite superhero origin movies of all time. This movie actually has a pretty great art for Tony Stark, a man who, as Jensen puts it. A man who has everything. And nothing. Yeah, sure, he has it all, but he doesn't realize he has all he needs, which is his friends. It, I, I know that was sappy, I know, but... It is true, to be honest with you. And plus, it's a story that takes Tony Stark from a reckless, careless billionaire to a man trying to correct his wrongs of his past and trying to leave behind a legacy that doesn't involve weapons that take lives. I mean, you gotta admire that, right? Look, whether I like the MCU or not, I cannot deny this is one hell of a start to this cinematic universe. And unfortunately, the next two movies don't do quite as well in terms of quality. Wolf. Judy Foo, she's the devil. She's, she's super jelly. She's just so jelly. Shut up. <laughs>